Hello, beloved, and welcome to this uh, weekly Bible study uh, where we are going to continue with our study on the person of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being a person. Uh, if you remember correctly, last week we looked at some more biblical evidence that the Holy Spirit is in fact a person, got the characteristics of a person. And as I said, it is in the New Testament that we have the clearest teachings that the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, as the Father is a person and the Son is a person within the Trinity, likewise the Holy Spirit is a person. So, once again, I'm not saying, or Scripture doesn't tell us that the Holy Spirit is a person like we are people, right? He's not a person like that. He is a person within the Trinity, within the Godhead. In that sense, he is a person. And he is known in the in the New Testament, or the way that the New Testament talks about or writes about uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, it writes about the Holy Spirit, the, the New Testament writes about the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit being a person, now, the third person in the Trinity. Before we continue, let's just have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for your love and kindness towards us. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done for us. And thank you that we can study the Holy Spirit and specifically this perspective of the Holy Spirit from the New Testament that the Holy Spirit indeed is not a, is a person, not a force or a power. So I pray, Father, that you will please enable us to understand, to make your word our own and uh, enable us to to take it to heart and understand this, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Enable me as your servant to teach your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, in the New Testament, we also find, above all the others that we've already discussed, we, def- we find that what people do to the Holy Spirit basically shows us that the Spirit is a person. Now, the things that can be done to the Holy Spirit. Is, there's certain things that are done to the Holy Spirit, which only makes sense if He is a person. For example, the Spirit can be grieved. Now, if you go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, we read, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, what is important is the context of Ephesians chapter 4 basically shows us that the thing which grieves the Holy Spirit is actually sin, any kind of sin. It grieves the Holy Spirit. You see, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God, let's say by giving way to any wrong temper or unholy word or unrighteous deed or action. If we give way to these things, that's basically sin. We grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, God the Holy Spirit is grieved when His children, because remember the Holy Spirit is part of the triune God, uh, and the Holy Spirit is grieved when His children refuse to to change their the, the old ways, now, their old ways of sin and rebellion against God and enmity against God, um, when they refuse to change it for things that are righteous and things that are uh, pure and beautiful and and loving and so on. We grieve the Holy Spirit. Basically, the bottom line is we grieve the Holy Spirit by sinning against God. Isaiah 63 verse 10 says, But they rebelled, and this is Israel, now, they rebelled and grieved His Holy Spirit. And so He turned Himself against them as an enemy, and He fought against them. And that's how strongly God feels um, about his children, and, and in this case it was uh, Israel, who grieved the Holy Spirit. They actually made God an enemy, even though they were the chosen people of God. They made God an enemy that fought against them like an enemy. And, and that's, that's heartbreaking. All right, so we can grieve the Holy Spirit. You cannot grieve a thing. You can't grieve a a tree or a, a rose bush or something like that. You can't, that, that doesn't happen, but you can grieve a person. Okay. 
another one we find in the Holy uh, in the New Testament about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed, and this is a a very important one. There is a lot of confusion about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because Jesus said that all sin, even sin against the Son of Man, will be forgiven. But the, how can I say, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it will not be uh, forgiven. Now, we read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 and 32, it says the following. It says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. Now, there's a lot of people that are very, very afraid of the fact that maybe they've committed the sin against the Holy Spirit. Maybe they've blasphemed the Spirit. Uh, but, beloved, it's not that easy. Uh, most scholars, they interpret this as somebody who constantly, uh, on a on a a constant basis reject the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives to, to, to draw them to Christ, to show Christ to them, to, to um, bring the, the gospel to them so that they can come to salvation. Somebody that constantly, how can I say, rejects the work of the Holy Spirit in their life, that would be the sin against the Holy Spirit. That would be the greatest sin. And there is no forgiveness for that. And it's actually obvious now. If you reject Christ, you reject for salvation. You reject eternal life. And that is as good as blaspheming the, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Mark chapter uh, 3, verse 28 to 30, gives us a, a very important aspect of the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And I want to share that with you quickly. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 28 to 30. You must please turn there so you can read it with me. Because this is the closest clear explanation we can find in the New Testament uh, of what it means to blaspheme, blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Right, and this is what Mark chapter 3, verse 28 to 30 says. It says, Assuredly, I say to you, all sin will be forgiven the Son of Men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Then verse 30 says, Why is there no forgiveness? Why, is there, or how, why are they subject to eternal condemnation? Verse 30 says, Because they said, He has an unclean spirit. Who is this speaking about? It's speaking about Jesus now. But what were they saying? You see, the, the people in Jesus' time were saying that he was casting out devils or casting out demons in those days through Beelzebub, now the Lord of the Flies, the, 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 the ruler of the, let's say, the evil demonic world. So basically what they were saying is that Jesus was casting out demons through the power of the devil. Okay? And, and that means that they were saying that Jesus Christ was demon-possessed. Okay? That's basically what it boils down to. Because it says in verse 30, because they said he has an unclean spirit. They actually said he had Beelzebub in him. That's what they said. Now, the, the blasphemy was not against Jesus Christ in the sense of saying that Jesus Christ had Beelzebub in him. But it was against the Holy Spirit. They were saying that the Holy Spirit of God is the devil. And that Jesus had the devil in him. So in that context, the blasphemy in, uh, against the Holy Spirit is to say in those days that Jesus Christ, in all the miracles that he did, and casting out of demons and everything that he did, that he was possessed by the devil when Jesus was, in fact, filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus at uh, the Jordan River when God declared 
This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, it's important for us to understand that had to be said about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit at that specific stage. So it's that is not possible today because Jesus is no longer on the earth. He is no he, he's not here. And he's not casting out demons um you know and clean, helping people to be cleansed from evil spirits. He's not doing it now. Okay, but in those days when Jesus was doing it the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of those days that Jesus called the children of the devil anyway, they were saying that Jesus was doing it through unclean spirits, that he, uh, the, uh, unclean spirit, that he was casting out demons through the power of the devil. Okay, I hope that makes sense. In our context, the way that it is explained by most commentaries, the fact that if somebody continuously uh, reject the work of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit brings people on somebody's path to share the gospel, to share the good news, and people continuously reject it. It cannot be. Th there's no way that that person can receive forgiveness of sin. There's no way that that person can um, receive uh, eternal life through what Jesus Christ did for them because they reject the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that's try that's that's um, doing everything. Uh, to um, bring that person to the point of salvation, if a person uh, would reject that. Okay. I hope that makes sense. But the, in the context of um, Mark chapter 3, verse 28 and, uh, to 30, it is very clear that it, was, it, is what has been, it is about what was said about Jesus Christ when he was ministering on the earth, that it was said directly that what he was doing he wasn't doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't doing it through the, the Spirit of God. He was doing it through Beelzebub. Okay? He was doing it through Satan, basically. Okay? The ruler of the, the underworld kind of thing. Okay? But there's another one in the New Testament, and that is that the Spirit can be resisted. In Acts chapter 7, verse 51, and it kind, kind of goes inside now with with what is what the blasphemy or the sin against the Holy Spirit is, uh, somebody can resist the Holy Spirit, can resist the work of the Holy Spirit in his or her life. They can resist salvation. They can resist any work of God. They can resist the knowledge of Christ. They can resist anything. Um, so that's another thing that can be done. Uh, the Spirit can be resisted. In Acts chapter 7, verse 51, we read, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. You see, Israel were just like, un how can I say, they were as unclean before God as the uncircumcised Gentiles were unclean before God. They thought they were clean before God because they were circumcised. No, they had to be circumcised in the heart. They were stiff-necked and they were uncircumcised in the heart and the ears. That's where they needed the circumcision. That's where they needed, a, 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 how can I say, a cutting of the heart so that, and the cutting of the ears so that they could hear the truth, accept the truth, and their hearts be cut so that they could receive the gospel. You see, the, 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 um, Israel were basically rejecting the Holy Spirit's messengers and their message. So they were resisting the Holy Spirit. And the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. And beloved, if you continuously do that, if you just resist the work of the Spirit the whole time, you resist it and resist it and resist it. And, and over and over and over again, the Holy Spirit comes and, and, and uh, brings messengers to you and uh, the, brings the gospel to you and ministers to you in different ways, opens up your eyes to see who Christ is and all those things. And you reject him. You resist him. Uh, there's no way you can be saved. We have to embrace what the Holy Spirit brings to us. When He brings the gospel, we have to embrace the gospel. When He brings messengers who brings the good news to us, we need to embrace that. All right, but then the Spirit can also be lied to. Not only resisted, but lied to. It's another thing. Now you can say, well, you can't lie to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows all things. Obviously, he knows all things. That's a fact. But remember, remember, when God works in this world where we are, 
where we are caught up in time and space, God speaks to us and works with us within time and space. Right? So in that sense, he will give the message, listen, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Even though he knew, he knows, because God is God. But he will speak because he's speaking to a person that is in time and space, that needs to understand what they were doing that was wrong. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, for example, we read, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Now, this is interesting because they took land, sold the land, but then decided to keep a part of that land back, which means, and then went to the disciples and gave them the money as if it was all of it. Uh, the land was theirs. They could do with the money whatever they wanted. That's not the issue. The thing is, they kept back and they decided to lie. But they thought they were lying to, to Peter and the other apostles and the other brothers and sisters. But in fact, they were not. They were lying to the Holy Spirit. So, in that sense, it was serious enough for Ananias and his wife Sapphira to both lose their lives. They both died because of their disobedience to the Holy Spirit, because they lied to the Holy Spirit. All right. And then the Holy Spirit, more on a positive note, can be obeyed. In Acts chapter 10, for example, verse 19 and 20, we read, Acts chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, it says, While Peter thought about the vision, remember this, this, this blanket that was coming out of, um, out of heaven with all these animals in it, it says that the Spirit then said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Verse 20, Arise therefore, go down and go with them, um, and doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And this is where the Holy Spirit um, was about to send um, Peter to Cornelius to hear the gospel. Him and his household to hear the gospel. Because we read in the next chapter, in Acts chapter 11 verse 12, we read, Then the Spirit told me, that is, spoke to Peter, né? to go with them, doubting nothing. And moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, um, and we entered the man or that's Cornelius's house. All right, so Peter was obedient to the Holy Spirit that told him that he needed to go to Cornelius's house. And obviously when he got to Cornelius's house, he could preach the gospel. And Cornelius and his uh, family, those who believed, they were baptized and they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they became believers. Absolutely amazing. And uh, Peter learned a lesson about the Gentiles, that the gospel can also go to the Gentiles and Gentiles who are actually were seen as unclean by the Jews, uh, they could also come to salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, beloved, these things that I've just shared with you, uh, when it comes to, for example, um, the spirit can be grieved, the spirit can be blasphemed, the spirit can be uh, resisted, the spirit can be lied to, and the spirit can be obeyed, these things can only be done to a person. Okay? We cannot lie to a stone. It means nothing to that stone. We cannot obey a, a tree or a chair. It, it, it just doesn't work that way. So these things that I've just mentioned, uh, that we find clearly written in the New Testament, can only be done to a person. Now, very interesting. Now, I'm not um, Zulu speaking, but um, there's something that, that happens in the Zulu language that is different. Uh, it, actually, they say in the Koza language as well, that's different to the way that uh, the Greek language works. Now, in the Koza and the Zulu language, they say that there is no distinction between he, she, or it. For example, when you say ula la, um, that could mean he stays, or she stays, or it stays. Okay? But the Greek is not like that. 
The Greek language has a way to make a difference between male, that's he, or female, she, or neuter, ne? the neutral one, uh, which is it. It's not male or female. Now, the word for spirit in the Greek language is the word pneuma. Okay, and that word pneuma in the Greek is a neuter word, which means it's neutral. It's neither male nor female. Um, so this basically tells us that the, the, the Spirit of God is not male and he is not female either. All right, but whenever the Bible uses a personal pronoun to basically speak of the Spirit of God, it never uses the neuter pronoun, which means the, the neutral one. Talking about the Holy Spirit as it, which means not male or female. But what, the, what we find within the Greek language is that it always uses the masculine pronoun. So it always speaks about the Holy Spirit as he, not it. All right, so even in the pronoun that is used for the Holy Spirit, um, it's the male, uh, the masculine pronoun that is used. It's the same with God. When a pronoun is used for God, the Father, uh, it is masculine. It's not uh, neuter. It's not neutral. All right, to say that God is not male or female, uh, it is male. Okay, that's the, the one that is being used um, for God and for God's Spirit, obviously. And we know that Jesus Christ was a man when he was on this earth. Ne? He's the Son of God. He's not the daughter of God. He's the Son of God. So likewise, the Spirit is male in uh, the personal pronoun. Okay, so, beloved, as we read the New Testament, we can see that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. We see that the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. We see that the Holy Spirit can be resisted. And the Spirit can be lied to. And the Spirit can be obeyed. And in using a, how can I say, a, a, a pronoun for the Holy Spirit, it is masculine. And it just tells us and shows us that the Holy Spirit is a person. Obviously, again, he's not a person like you and I. Now, he's, a, he's a person as the third person in the Trinity. Absolutely amazing. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can learn from your word about the Spirit. And thank you so much that we can learn the truths that we find in uh, Scripture about the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Father, that as we get to know uh, these these truths about the Holy Spirit, that we understand a little bit better uh, how the Holy Spirit works. And we can look to Him uh, in a different way than what we did before, a more biblical way. So I pray, Father, that when we look to the Holy Spirit, when we look at what the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit is described in the Bible, that our understanding will be biblical and not the way that the world looks at it and the way that we find in certain churches or certain people groups. So we pray, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Beloved, remember, the Holy Spirit is not a power. It's not a force. The Holy Spirit is not a it. The Holy Spirit is a person Okay, with the characteristics of a person. But as the third person, in the Godhead. All right. Thank you for listening. God willing, until next time, when we uh, continue looking at the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and uh, give you His peace. God willing, until next time. Bye-bye.